Well, there is a lady, uh, some of you know this because you're like movie buffs or whatever, but there's a lady by the name of Bobette Buster, and she's affectionately called the story guru. She's a creative executive for companies like Pixar and 20th, 20th Century Fox and Disney Animation, so she's kind of like a big deal. And she's like the person you go to when you're trying to figure out how to tell a good story. These famous companies go to her and go like, how do we do this? And something that she says that's really profound is this. She says, human beings are narrative animals. And I would agree. We are people that are made for story. If we look back, we can see that narrative has been an integral part of our fabric since the very beginning. We look at God and we know that he is a storyteller. And every week, you and I, we gather around this book full of stories of people whose lives have gone before us, but also we gather around this incredible story that has transformed and changed us. And the truth is, I think we not only love a good story, but we want a good story. As humans, there's a desire in us to live into something that is beautiful and extraordinary. And the reality is, whether you're aware of it or not, there is a script or a story that you are living into presently. There is something, some message or multiple messages that are shaping the way that you live. And while that can be extraordinarily beautiful, it can also be scary. Because as uh, we know that our families weren't perfect, and we know that most of our scripts come from our family, <laughs> which is problematic for most. That means that there are many of us tonight who are living stories uh, with narratives that are destined to be untrue, which means there's something here, there's some place then, a space where God has to intersect and meet us. So we're going to talk about that more in just a second, but I would love it if you turn with me in your Bibles. Uh, we're going to jump into the scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And before we get into today's text, I'd like to give you a bit of context around what we're stepping into. Uh, the writer of this letter, it's officially a letter, it's like in our book, but it's a letter, is a guy by the name of Paul. You guys remember him? He was like a church starter. He was an apostle. That's like the church language for who he was. He was a faithful follower of Jesus. He was a missionary. And he's writing a letter to these people who live in this place called Corinth. And he had previously planted a church and started a church there. And so he's writing with some instruction. Paul had somewhat of a complicated relationship with the church of Corinth as they often found themselves wrapped up and tangled in a bit of sin. And so uh, we read all kinds of things from Paul, but today as we read what he's talking about and what, where we're going to go with tonight's text, we read that Paul is actually responding to a letter that they had sent him. These, they're responding to some, he's responding to some accusations that were, were placed on him that he was confronted with in a letter. And these accusations came from some corrupt church leaders who were now in Corinth trying to assume leadership in the church that he started. And throughout the book of 2 Corinthians, you're going to see there's like lots of different scripts that happen. There's a bunch of accusations coming at Paul, and Paul kind of like, like a ninja defends each one. You know, it's like, shwing, shwing. I don't know. Uh, that was for all the men in here, and it didn't seem like it was a blessing to you. Um, <laughs> and we see Paul defending these accusations, but here in chapter 10, he is defending one of the biggest accusations that were, was placed against him, and that was that they were saying that Paul was living according to the world's standards and not by God's standards. And so in chapter 10, we find Paul in the middle of his defense. And it's clear, what I love, this is such a beautiful part of who Paul is, who God made Paul, but he's not trying to defend himself as so many of us would do, but he is trying to defend the gospel that he had preached. So just a second really quick on Paul, for those of you who aren't super familiar with him. Paul's this really unique guy. He, when he first like, came onto the scene, his name was Saul. But when he met Jesus, his name got changed to Paul. And, and, and Saul, before he was Paul, not to, not to be super confusing, uh, but their names rhyme. It could have been like Todd, you know, like Paul, you know, Saul and Todd. But no, it wasn't. Uh, Saul and Paul, before when he was Saul, um, he was a persecutor of the church, actually. He was like the antithesis of what he had become. He, he was hostile towards the way and the teachings of Jesus, so much so that he was willing to put people to death if they would follow this crazy rabbi from Nazareth. And then Paul has this encounter with Jesus, kind of face-to-face, -face, big moment, and his life is changed. And not only is his life changed, but his story is changed. 
And so we see all throughout the New Testament that Paul, when Paul's talking, this is just such a beautiful thing, he's constantly saying, I was this and now I am this. There's this beautiful uh, dichotomy in his language that we find uh, when we're reading through the New Testament. I was talking to my dad about this text earlier in the week, and he's a pastor, and he's like really brilliant. He's also very cute, and he'll be here in a couple weeks, so I'm really excited. Um, But I was talking to him, I was like, Dad, it's so weird. Paul is such a strange character to, to wrestle with as we're looking at this text. And he said, you know, it doesn't surprise me that Paul is so emphatic with his language about what he was and what he is and how he's shoving that onto us all the time, right? He says, you are ambassadors. You are new creations. This is the language that he uses. And he said, from a man who was so radically transformed, you you have to think that for a second there were times that he struggled with those old scripts. You know, that I was a blasphemer, a violent man. I was a murderer these different scripts that might come back. He was so adamant at how he kept the truth before him. And so tonight, we're gonna see that all the more. So let's read our text, verses three three to five together. Paul says, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. A familiar text to some of you, but to some of you, not familiar. In, in verse three, Paul starts out, and from my perspective, he is so wonderfully sassy in his address, which I just appreciate so much. I don't think that's biblically accurate, but it's just my feeling. Um, Paul agrees with his accusers. He's stating yes. Remember the accusation was that he was living by the world's standards and he says, yeah guys, I do live in the world. We live in a world, meaning we exist in a place where there's limitations, there are frustrations, there are pains. There's things here that are, that are different than the spiritual world. And he goes on to say quickly that we don't wage war, is this language he uses, as the world does. And as good readers of the text, we ask why he's using this war language. At the time, um, remember that Paul is writing in a, in a time when Rome was ruling the world and war was language that they understood. They also think Paul is at some level, even if it's subversive, denouncing the cultural narrative that violence is the way to resolve problems. Paul is essentially saying here that we don't live in a world, we we live in the world, but we do not play by their rules. We don't do things the way that they do things, nor are we limited by the world's resources. In verse four, Paul goes on, stating that the weapons or the tools that we use to fight uh, with are not the ones that the world uses. Paul is referencing actual uh, war and actual weapons of violence to create a clear dichotomy between the way of the people of God and the way of the world. One uses violence or weapons of violence and the other rejects them in favor of something else. In the text we see that we're not bound by what the world can see or accomplish. He says we've been giving something extraordinary Something, he says, that has divine power. And so the text unfolds even further, and he says, this is what we use this divine power to do. And so clearly with this one phrase, I mean, I don't know why, it's just been just settled with me all week. But he says, they are to to demolish strongholds. When we read that, I mean, honestly, I can't think of one time that I said demolish or stronghold this week. Like, that's not our language. I don't know if you did, maybe. Maybe you were like, demolish, you know, Duke. (laughs) I'm about to make somebody mad at church. Anyway, uh, some of you basketball people care about that. Others do not, uh, which is the majority of you. So that was a terrible uh, joke. What does he actually mean? Demolish strongholds. In the Greek, the word stronghold, uh, the word, uh, strongholds uh, literally means a fortress. It's like the, the least penetrable part of the castle. It, it's the place uh, that the defense could not break through because it was so severely and strongly held together and kept. 
So here, Paul, with his like, quick statement uh, that we pass over, I've passed over about 900 times, says that this divine power actually has uh, the ability to not just like say, excuse me, could you scoot over a little bit? My wife's coming, like move over, and then take the seat next to him. It's not any of that. He's saying that this divine power has the ability to demolish the things in our life that we think are immovable. This divine power we've been given, this world that we live in now as we are heirs of Christ, we now have the authority and the power to, to demolish the things that feel impenetrable in our life. Those narratives, those belief systems that, that say it's impossible. Here, Paul's saying that, that the gospel, the power of Jesus intersects that and actually can crush it. And it's extraordinary. And then he goes on, he's going to elaborate a little bit, which I love about Paul, because he has more things to say. He says, not only can it demolish strongholds, we can demolish every argument with that. And some of you are like, argument? Here's what this means. In the text, it, it literally means the reasoning that takes shape in your mind and then is worked out in your life as an action. So again, I've bypassed this like a thousand times in the text, but, but this is one of those places where the Spirit of God hooked me this week because there's so many moments, I don't even realize it, but I am arguing with God a lot. I think I'm gonna be a blessing as a wife, uh, but man, I was thinking about how many times I was arguing with God this week, and um, I thought, man, that's gonna be an issue. That's gonna be an issue if this, if this you know, gets out there. Um, so I'm just, God's sanctifying me now, husband, so just be ready. Um, I just want you to know. So often in our minds, we're disagreeing with God about what's actually happening or what we should be doing. Those little moments where he asks you to obey or to enter in and you go, no, I'm busy. I have stuff to do. And God's like, could you just make a call or send a text or whatever it may be? And those are the small, tiny moments even where we, we bypass it. And we have reasoned in our mind that it's something we don't need to do. And so we don't do it. And, and God was like, pay attention to that. This power has the ability to demolish every argument, everything that you have reasoned in your life to be true and are living into. Some of you, that's called bondage. Some of you have been reasoning in your head that that porn that you're looking at every night is okay. And here God is saying, I have the power, even when you don't believe it, to demolish every argument you are making. And it's miraculous. And then he goes on and he says, um, uh, every pretension is this language he is. I'm like, again, don't know what pretension is. I'm like, on Google, like, what is a pretension? And some of you brilliant people are like, of course, we know what that is. Okay, good. Um, But some of us don't. This is any place that we have arrogance or areas of pride in our life. Any place in us that says that we know better than God. And this can be all kinds of things. For, for example, some of us have a really uh, set idea about what we believe about sexuality and the parameters that surround it. We've decided what's okay and what's not okay when clearly God's word has already said what it is. These are these small places that, again, lead to a place of bondage, of us living into things that are not true about ourselves or who God has made us. And Paul says that the divine power we've been given, these weapons we've been given, can demolish these things. Finally, he says that we're to take captive every thought. This is the one we are all decently familiar with, at least some of us are. We're to take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. The image here in the Greek is that you're taking captive a prisoner of war. I don't know why I'm hugging him, but so be it. Uh, I'm coming from behind, you know, I feel like a really, that's like a move. Um, It's this language of of taking a prisoner of war. Now, most of us in this room, almost 100% of us do not have a concept of what it means to take a prisoner of war. We see it in the movies, we have like some decent understanding, but we don't actually know what it means. And and you have to sit just for a second and try to figure out what he's saying. He's saying, take captive. Now, there's going to be, there's going to be pretensions. There's there's going to be arguments. There's going to be strongholds. And now my exhortation to you is that we have the ability to actually take captive the thoughts that lead us to those places and make them obedient to Christ. To take a prisoner of war is life or death. That's what it comes down to. If you start to sit down and have a snack with your prisoner of war, he might just cut your head off. 
Like that's how serious it is. And it's hard for us to conceptually understand it, but that's what he's saying. He's saying there's no wiggle room with taking captive and how many thoughts or what thoughts? Every thought. And submitting it. The word obedience is submission to Jesus. I know the word submission has all kinds of things tangled up all over it. But here, submission in the text means we actually just get to kind of hold it up to Jesus and say, what do you think about this thought? Bringing your thoughts to Jesus can change your reality. So so we take our thoughts captive like we would a prisoner of war with that much careful attentiveness and we bring it up to him and say, what do you think? And he gets to tell us what's actually true about the argument, about the arrogance, about the strongholds. And if we would just listen, it would change the game. Paul understood something that so many of us miss. He understood that in order to live into the truth, to live into the story of who you really are over who you think you are or over who you've been told that you are, all of that is going to start in your mind. Because ultimately your thoughts are the author of your narrative script. Or another way to say that is that the scripts uh, that you have live and always exist somewhere in your mind. The war for your true identity takes place right here. And that's why Paul's exhorting us so strongly to take captive every single thought. The beautiful thing is that with this divine power we've been given, we have not only the ability to demolish the untrue narrative scripts of our life, but we have the opportunity to have them replaced with truth, and not Oprah's truth, and not, well, I'm not gonna, anyway, Jesus' truth. See, that was called self-control, okay? Just wanted to share that with you. I'm just growing in that, right? Right before your eyes. Okay, now, now we're feeling really excited because the text is really empowering. I keep talking about story, and I keep talking about narrative scripts, and some of you are still like, what is she talking about? which is pretty common, but anyway, that's a thing. Uh, So I want to tell you just a little bit about what they are exactly, what are narrative scripts. I want to tell you why they matter. You have a glimpse of it here in the text, but I want to tell you why I think it matters for us to get a grip on this. And then I want to talk about how we identify the scripts that are in our lives. Some of us can't even begin to fathom what it is that we're hearing or living into. So we're going to do that tonight, and, and it'll be really fun. Okay, so what is a narrative script? At its most basic level, these scripts are messages that inform the way we behave. They're little messages given to us, predominantly and largely from our family of origin, but also from outside uh, places, from events or experiences that shape the way that we actually live our lives. And then on, on top of that, it's like all these little messages that we've been picking up over time actually forms like a sandwich, if you will, of the story we're presenting to the world. And, and this is what a narrative script is. And like I said, most of our scripts come uh, from our childhood or through relationships with our parents. They can also come through these key events like divorce, those are things I think of, or death, or abandonment, whatever it may be. And while I don't think there's any question uh, that you would uh, have around this idea of, it, of your scripts being powerful and having influence over you, I do think you will be asking, what is a script comprised of? At least I like to pretend you want to ask me that question. So I'm going to answer it. Scripts are comprised of three things. This is what you need to know. Events, emotions, and interpretations. Events, they are just what they sound like. Now, this could be as simple as a parent yelling at you or a parent consoling you, or as big as a traumatic event like the loss of a parent or divorce or rejection in relationship. And, and I want to say this, so often it's easy to minimize the events in your life, but if you're actually on the journey to discover what your script is, nothing is off the table. A lot of our scripts come from our everyday life experiences. And so it's important that you pay attention to those. I also want to note that uh, the events uh, can also be repeated patterns of behavior. For example, if your parent forgot you at school on a regular basis, 
a script could have been formed. You're the kid, you know, sitting there on the curb waiting for your parent. So it's important, remember, that repeated events can also be events uh, where, where scripts were kind of created and cultivated. So we get it, we know what events are. So these are events. Uh, then there's emotions. So around these events were emotions. There were feelings and thoughts, some of my favorite things. And again, I want to say that um, no uh, emotion, whether positive or negative, is insignificant in this formula. It's easy to dismiss our feelings so often, particularly culturally, because we don't give room for them very often. But again, it's important. Keep them on the table. Now, there's a lot of you in this room who are less prone to feel. I can't even imagine what that must feel like. Like, are you actually happy? I I'm being funny, not serious. I know some of you are like, I think we're, okay, are we going somewhere? Uh, you're trying to track with me, me too. And maybe you've chosen to not, you know, deal with your emotions. You've decided not to. My sister is the decider. She can, like, decide to not feel something, and it happens. I try, but then I'm, like, having feelings about my decision. You know, that's, like, me. <laughs> so it's not, not for me. Some of you prefer not to. Some of you feel overwhelmed at the thought of doing it, so you avoid it altogether. And some of you just think it's a waste of time. And I just want to say this with all the love I can muster, which I have a ton of it, so just here. Emotions have and will continue to play a critical role in your relational development. The longer you suppress or ignore the emotions in your life, the longer you delay and even impede the relational growth that God is calling you to live into. I know you're not all feelers. I know some of you are thinkers, but we all feel we're experiential people. This is how God designed and created us. And I know, I do, I sit with you, and I, again, I experience and feel things very deeply. I know it's overwhelming to have the emotions that we have. But as people of Jesus, God's given us the ability to deal with and sit in our emotions. Jesus himself was a God who felt things and experienced things through his emotions. There's a call to us tonight to be the same way. Now, events and emotions do not make up a narrative script. So some of you are like, can we just stop right there? No, we won't keep going. Uh, one more step. Final step is interpretation. Our interpretation of our event and the emotions that surrounded that event is where your script is actually formed. So often, our interpretation becomes a part of our identity. So I can have an experience with you off over here in the annex after the teaching where I can't tell um, if you're mad at me or you love me. I'm like very confused even though I'm trying to discern so wisely what you're feeling. And I can go home and, uh, or I could talk to, maybe go into the back room and talk to Gerald and be like, I don't know, it was so weird, such a weird experience that I had. And then I go home at night and all of a sudden I start interpreting what you actually think about me. She doesn't like me. That's just the bottom line. She thinks I'm way too much. And so when I see you next time, the way I approach you is that you see me as too much. My interpretation rules the dynamics and experience in our relationship. Does that make sense? Yeah. So interpretation is a powerful thing. It's so, mindful for, it's so important for you to be mindful about the things that you have interpreted. So important to be aware of what those are, particularly if you are a young person trying to make up and understand what was happening in your family. I think about divorce, and I think every, um, almost every, and I'm a child of divorce, so I'm like sitting with you, but I think all of us at some level interpreted that event as I was the problem. Now, in our adult brains, we know that's not the truth, right? We know we weren't responsible for our parents breaking up, but the interpretation of that event jammed a script into us so powerful and potent that a lot of us are crippled in relationship today because of it. The interpretation of an event is far more powerful than most of us are willing to admit. And so it's important to identify the events, the emotions that surrounded it, and most importantly, the interpretation of those events and emotions because that's going to tell you exactly the narrative that you are believing and living into. Okay, why do scripts matter? 
if narrative scripts have the power to shape your life, then it's easy to conclude that they matter. I think most of you, in theory, would agree. But that's me up here talking about all my stuff. You are not talking about yours. So it's easy for you to be like, girl, good for you. What a blessing. You are doing something great, you know? And then I'm going, but are you? And so it's easy for us in theory to go, man, this is a really powerful thing. But I don't know if it's for me. And I'm here to tell you tonight that it is for you. If that's what you're feeling, it's for you. Untrue narrative scripts have had power over many of us for a long time. And whether we notice it or not is absolutely in influencing the way that we're engaging in relationship with the people we love. Our bosses, our friends, our spouses, it's shaping and influencing how we are in relationship. The, the intimacy level that we're having with other people. It's impacting how we actually see the world at large. Whether they are good scripts or bad scripts, here's the scary thing. Many of you are living into untrue scripts, and they have weird and crazy and powerful effects. Some of us are bitter, and we hate ourselves. Now, we don't say it, but we live that way. Some of us don't know how to receive love because at our core we're buying into the script that I am absolutely unlovable, so stay away. Some of us feel deep loneliness and hopelessness and have considered hurting ourselves or taking our life because we're believing some lie, some untrue script that says we are the problem. And if you eliminate the problem, then you have the solution. Hear me when I say your scripts will own you. They will shape you and influence you until you own them. Until you acknowledge the power that they've had. Remember that story guru I was talking about at the beginning, Babette Buster? She says this, a good story is comprised of two components, reinvention and redemption. If you don't have those two components in your story, the story is what they call in the business a flop. I learned that. And she's right. The truth is, I know, maybe you wouldn't say it because some of you are like, I don't know. I don't want a story that flops. And you know why I don't? Because the creator of the universe made me in such a way that I am supposed to be telling a story that changes everything. It's innate to my person to not want the story to flop because I have a reinvented and redeemed narrative bursting out of me. And the same should be true for you. We are people who live in the kingdom, which means we live in a brand new reality. We have access, like Paul said, to divine power. And no matter what our scripts have been, no matter how it's determined our behavior, we have this extraordinary opportunity, if we'll only ask, if we'll only own what these scripts are, to be reinvented and redeemed. To have the scripts that were immovable, impenetrable, blown up and demolished, and then given an entirely new, better one. This is what God has created us for. To tell stories that are remarkable because he is remarkable. Because he is the author of every good story I could ever tell you. He's the best part of me, and he is the best part of you. And he's calling us to live into that reality. All right, so I know some of you note takers are like, when are we going to take notes? <laughs> that makes me laugh. Uh, anyway, I sit next to you a lot. I'm like, what are you doing? Um, <laughs> how do I identify my scripts? How do we do it? So you're talking about them. I'm bought in. I'm, I'm believing you. How do we do it? I bet some of you could guess what I'm about to say, but you got to go back. you got to go back to your family of origin. But by now, we're just banking on the fact that y'all are pros at this. You're like, Gina Graham, hold on, let me get my phone. I'm going to show you something. Right? Yeah, some of you are like, it's a little bit slower <laughs> over here. But okay, we're with you, and we're excited for you. Just as we inherit generational sins, just as we inherit relational patterns, we too inherit messages from our family. 
Majority of messages come from our mom or dad or the primary caretaker in our life. And this is powerful. Our parents had a significant influence on our personality, on our emotional development, on our behavioral habits, on our relational skills, meaning how you related, who you learned from, and what you observed all communicated a message to you or messages. The same is true from, like I said, significant life events or from siblings. I have a sense, like really clearly, that some of us have been really wounded by our siblings. That some of the scripts many of us have been living into come from the people who are, you know, literally with like all the blood and all that stuff closest to us. All these things require you to go back. Now, where do I go back? I'm like looking at my genogram. I'm like, there's not a spot for narrative scripts. And I'm out of, I've written all of our stuff, and there's no more room if your genogram's like mine. I'm like, it's filled. So where do we go? Well, we can go to our memory. Memory is, is the gift that God gave us to build intimacy and relationship. If you didn't remember me from last week, if you had no memory of who I was, When I got back up here, you'd feel very little attachment to me. Thankfully, at least for the most part, you guys remember me and you think, that was a good experience. Some of you are like, that was a bad experience. And you're having feelings right now too, and we respect that. (laughs) Memory is where most of our scripts, almost all of our scripts live. Because memory is where we actually received that script. So if you're wondering where to start, you start with your memories. Start with the memories that are most accessible to you. The things you can remember, remember and then work back from there. Now, it, this is a little bit tricky. Some of you are like, I don't know how. Um, well, there's a lot of different ways to do it, and I'll talk about that in just a second. But a lot of you have, just think back, Christmases, think holidays, think Easter, think whatever it may be, when your parents got divorced, whatever. That's low-hanging fruit. Grab it and start there. God, was there a script? that I interpreted some way that wasn't true about myself or even about the people that I love from that experience. So start with your memories. Next, tell your story. I know it's like such a cool, I don't know, maybe that was like 10 years ago. I have no idea. I'm getting older, like more beautiful and stuff, but it's, it's a harder journey. I'm disconnected from the younger people. I do Snapchat, but I pretty much only Snapchat my best friend. That's pretty much it, like that and like two other people. But I don't even know how to do it. I don't really, I just like the faces and the voices. That's what I like. (laughs) But a lot of us, I don't know if kids say it anymore, but girl, tell me your story. I don't know if, okay, so maybe they do or maybe they don't, I don't know. but, But we tell our story. So many of us actually have never told our whole story. That's true. Because you don't, we don't, I don't actually believe you wanna hear it. And, And more than that, I don't believe it is worthy of being told. If and when we tell our story, we will quickly hear and see the things we need to see about what we believe about ourselves. I'm talking from beginning to end. I was born in Fort Worth, Texas. Yeah. (laughs) They're probably going to secede the Union soon, and I'm going to go probably. (laughs) Right? That's like my thing because it's on my birth certificate, so I'm going to go. But anyway, if that happens, what? I'll try to stay with you. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen, but born in Fort Worth. My dad's a pastor. My mom was a dancer. She's a ballerina. I always I just have these vivid memories of my mom being in the dance studio. I was really little and just, you know, getting the resin on her point shoes and going like an angel, just teaching people. She's a beautiful dancer. All of this storytelling is significant because it, it informs us of who we are and where we fit into the story we're living into. Tell your story to someone. Next, pray. All of this requires the help of the Holy Spirit. You cannot, you cannot address things this deeply in yourself without the Holy Spirit helping you. What's beautiful about this is there is one person who has borne witness to everything in your life. And his name is God. His name is Jesus of Nazareth. By his Holy Spirit, he has been with you since you were conceived. He, the only one who has the right to take you back to places you would never take yourself, is safe enough. 
He is trustworthy enough to take you back and help you understand what's actually true. You know who lies to you? Not God. You know who lies to you? Satan. The enemy, the devil, the one who is trying to kill, steal, and destroy from you. When you bring God back to those places, it's like the filter, the beautiful Snapchat filter that makes us all pretty. It's like that comes over us, right? And we see things as they really are. Some of you were too little to see what was really happening. You were too small to understand what was the truth in that situation. And only God can come back and show you and say, I was there. I saw what happened. I know the truth. And hear me, where the Spirit of the Lord is, in your memories and in these places, there is freedom. Freedom. When he goes back and takes you to these places, you are set free in your story. These deep parts of yourself are changed forever. Some of you are wondering how you get free. This is how. Next, you need to be in community. You need people in your life who are going to tell you what's true. My best friend is constantly good and quick at saying that's not true about me when I say things like I'm fat or I'm gross or I'm not good, I can't do that. I'm like, she's like, wait, no. That's not true. Just disagree with that. You need to disagree with that. Gerald is awesome at this in my life. He's constantly so quick to cut those things off. You need people, community, to to walk and work this out with you. They're a vital part of how you relearn what's true. When God tells you something what's true, you say it to somebody else as an act of faith. It may not feel true in the moment, but the more you speak it, the more you live into it, the more it becomes true. Finally, we're to take captive our thoughts, to take them prisoner, and to bring them to Jesus. It can sound really ambiguous and very Christianese to do that. I'm going to take captive my thoughts and make them obedient. All it means is a thought comes in your mind and you go, I'm going straight to Jesus. Hey, what's this thing? He's like, that's a good thing. You're like, great. Right? And then another thing, hey, God, there's this, this, this idea that I'm like so not good enough. I had it this morning. It happened. I was up long before any of you were even thinking about getting up. And I was up and I still look like this, so praise report. But anyway, <laughs> I was up praying and I heard the narrative You're not enough. You cannot do this. And I took that thought and I went, okay, I don't think I am. I was like shaking, handing it up to him. And he said, you're not, but I am. And I was like, okay, can I just put that on? He's like, put that on. Wear me. I'm sufficient to do this and to do it in an extraordinary way that will bless my people. It's been said that you can't change your past, but you can change the way you experience it. Discovering the narrative scripts that have shaped shaped your life, I know will be painful for many of you because I know they're not all good. I know they're deeply linked to memories that are extraordinarily hard and difficult. But on the other side of that is healing and freedom. On the other side of that is a brand new story, is a name change, is an address change, is a last name change. There's a change. When God changed our narrative scripts, he changes the way we view and experience our life. For years uh, in my own life, I just had this narrative that, that at some point people are definitely going to get tired of you and leave you. It's just like this over and over. It still happens. It still tries to sneak up in there. And I would live into the reality of like being afraid people were going to leave me, so I'd people please, or I'd, I'd work harder. And then I have this other script that says I'm not enough for anybody or anything. And so I just keep swinging back and forth. I'd be in codependent relationships. You guys know it's just, it was a mess. And I'm telling you that I'm standing here tonight with both of those scripts reversed. As I've gotten into God's presence, as we've done this hard work together, as I'm like, take me back to where that first came in. And he said, that's not what was happening at all. In those moments, now I get to stand before you as a person who people don't want to leave, but I actually believe that people want to stay. There's a part of me believes that someone one day is going to want to stay for the long haul. We say, come Lord Jesus. (laughs) 
I believe that I am enough, just the way that I am, because I'm delighted in by the God who made me. And that, for some reason now, is sufficient. My prayer for you as you do this throughout the week, as you press into this, and even now, tonight, as we take space to press into it, is that you would, in humility, find the courage to bring your scripts to Jesus and allow him to speak a better word than what has been spoken. Would you stand and pray with me?